Welcome to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to A Fork in Time. This is going to be the third installment in our November series, and I'm realizing now that it's probably going to spill into December, and that's okay, uh, on different issues kind of flowing through the presidency of JFK. Uh, I am joined today by Dr. Eric Rush. Do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Anybody who's been following the series knows it's it's a tag team. You and I taking this on. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's which has been great. <laughs> it's been uh, it's been good to get to uh, have the conversations with you, Chris. I think we've had a lot of fun on both a fork in time and a room where it happened. So, very glad to join you again for this latest installment. And and even though even though it is going to probably drop in December, just know that we are recording this on November twenty eighth. Yes. Yes. Um, so today's episode is about the Bay of Pigs invasion. So do you want to kind of give a little bit of a background on it, Eric, or would you like me to? Um, I can give a little background. And, and if, if it's okay with you, um, can I give just a little bit of background on Cuba in general? Because I, I think that, that the, the kind of the, the backstory of between Cuba and the United States plays a, plays a, lot, a large part in, in why it's so important. I, I always pull myself back from this, but you know what? Let's let's make this half this friggin' show <laughs> nothing but but what actually did happen. So yeah, yeah. So you have I, you have as much leash as you need. <laughs> all right, sounds good. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. So you know, Cuba and the United States have really had a, a very intertwined relationship for a, a number of years, for over hundred hundred years. And I think most of the listeners will recall that Cuba had been a Spanish colony for many years. And really, it was until the probably the late 19th century where you really saw some some interest from from Cuba in in independence. And there were several rebellions that occurred uh, in in Cuba from between about you know 1868 and 1898, and they had varying levels of success. But it still saw Cuba fundamentally under under Spanish rule until the Spanish American War. And so the the Spanish American War. Uh, started in 1898, and uh, events that happened with the USS Maine and in, in, in the Havana Harbor had a lot to do with us even getting into the war. And ultimately, the, the settled peace that, that was a result of that saw Cuba becoming a quote-unquote independent republic as the Republic of Cuba, but was really a U.S. protectorate which is very interesting when we think about this now, how much influence the U.S. really had on, on Cuba, especially during the first half of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the 20th century. And then, you know, I, I think about, about kind of the, the first inflection point in our story today, Chris, as being the coup of 1952. Um, and so um, I don't know if you have anything you want to say about the coup of 1952 that saw, saw Florencio Batista um, come to power. So I do want to talk about Batista a little bit. I it, it, it also builds to something we'll get to later on. I think it was the earlier episode on the Lime Lobby where uh, we talked about if you're studying Mexican history for about a 50 year span, mm -hmm. you need to find out where Santa Ana is. Right. If you're looking at Cuban history for a good 20 to 30 year span, you need to find out where Batista is. I would because. completely agree. Yeah, it re really between I would say probably the you know, the probably the early 30s at the latest and up until really 1959. Um, right. You really do need to know where Batista is. I, I totally agree, Chris. So do you why do you say the 1930s? Because because that's where I thought we were going back to. But let, let's build up from there. Well, so there were there were a lot of rebellions that occurred in in Cuba even during the early twentieth twentieth century, and and Batista was uh, was was responsible for or, or was heavily involved in, in a couple of them, and one and a, and I'm I'm going to call it the Sergeant's Rebellion, and I think that's right. Um, but uh, and this was a this was a group of of soldiers 
um, who are, who were were revolting against the 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 current Cuban government or the or the or the Cuban government at the time. And that was my recollection is that's kind of where Batista got, we'll say his start as a, as, as a revolutionary. Um, he started there uh, basically in the next government. Uh, for those of you not familiar with military ranks, he was a sergeant when that happened and he walked out of their commander in chief of the Cuban armed forces. There's a couple of steps that he jumped. Yeah, quite a quite a few steps to be jumped. That's not a that is not a, a typical military career for everybody to go straight from. Well, I don't know if it's straight from sergeant, but but quickly from sergeant to commander in chief. Uh, so yeah, very 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 true. Uh, and then he had some he had some some various forays into leadership in Cuba and um, and was kind of in and out of favor a couple of times. Uh, and so, um, do you? So, where where was Batista before 1952? You know, kind of in the events leading up to the coup of 1952. Where was he? He was waiting around. He was an ex president. Right. Uh, he was actually elected in what just basically everybody considered a free and fair election in 1940, mm-hmm. and he did step down in 1944 when there was another election. And the opposition defeated him. Mm -hmm. The opposition defeated him in 1944. And and this is one of those other interesting things. Cuba at this point did have a single term presidency. Yep. So the person he lost to in 19 or the person who defeated his successor, Mm -hmm. because there's always a successor. You're never running again. Right. Um, his successor in 44. Also, they that kind of clicked that party won again in 48. Mm-hmm. And by 1952, the, the coup that we're talking about, Batista's making noise about running again because right. now he's not president. He can run again. Right. Um, as I understand it, he's not exceptionally popular in this run correct but he is still very highly placed and very friendly with a lot of people in the military so he decides to short circuit that election of 1952 and put himself in charge militarily that yes. yeah exactly because he knew he knew that it was very unlikely that he would have won the election of 1952 and and just just to have the US U.S. And, and Cuba connection solidified a little further. Where was he serving his his exile? Miami. He was in Miami. It, and, and, and and it's not just him in Miami. There's no. yeah. No, no, it, you're you're exactly right. There's there there. It's it is a whole community of of, of Cuban exiles, and and there there were early and late Cuban exiles. I mean, there have been there there have been a lot of there. I mean, we have you know many Cuban Americans in 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 Florida, especially. Uh, but all over the country, but they, but they, they immigrated here in several waves. Yeah. And, and this was one of those interesting things we didn't get to in another podcast where we touched on Cuba, a lot of that has really had an effect on American politics, Mm -hmm. that large population. And by the way, how those Cubans came, why they came, what wave they came in, also has a really big effect on how they vote and how they experience the United States. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree there. I don't think there's any question of that. So at this point we're it's 1952 and there, and there's been a, a coup. And so now Batista has, has taken over by military force and is now back in, in charge of Cuba Again, he was, but he was a, he was still at least a, at least in some sense, a a U.S. ally at this point. And so where he was our guy and in, but over the course of the 1950s, we soured on Batista a little bit. Uh, He suspended the 1940 constitution. um, And although, oh, sorry, go ahead. By the way, for those of you, let's call back five minutes ago. He helped write the 1940 Constitution. He, he became president because of the 1940 Constitution, and then he turns around and throws it out the window. And and I think if we if we look at it through the at the time, I, my, you know, I, the 1940 Cuban Constitu- Constitution is fairly progressive. 
Um, and it, it's really progressive. Um, looking at kind of the things that came out of first that revolt of the sergeants you talked about in right. 1933, I'm reminded of, I'm just going to draw another comparison to Lazaro Cardenas, the yeah. president of Mexico at this point, uh -huh. who also was really progressive. And you, you kind of had this first wave of almost la anti-American, Latin America, anti United States, Latin American progressivism. You interestingly, if you look at what's going on in Spain right then, right. Cuba and Mexico sent a lot of help to the Republic. The yeah. only other country that did anything for the Spanish Republic, Soviet Union. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, Soviet Union. And, I had, and I, I, I'd actually kind of, I kind of <laughs> forgotten about that, Chris, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> Yeah, and and the other, you know, the other interesting thing, looking at some of the things that were passed by these earlier Cuban governments, they're saying that Cuban for any enterprise you have to employ fifty percent Cuban nationals. Uh -huh. You have, you know, they're giving rights to um, tenant farmers that they have mm -hmm. the right to a certain percentage of their crop. Mm -hmm. If you're a small sugar farmer, you get so much of your sugar refined for free. There's yeah minimum wages there's our restrictions and the interesting thing is you know from from what a lot of americans think about pre castro cuba pre-revolution cuba they think the united states ran it right but during this period we're talking about there was an ebb in the flow of that and and i think the ebb of that really starts in 1952 when Batista comes in and he does start undoing a lot of those reforms that had been put in place. He, he did. And, and I think at that point there, it's, it's very true, Chris, that the U S was, was certainly not running things um, in a, in a political sense, but it's also equally true that there were a lot of U S moneyed interests that were, that were heavily involved in Cuba and, and Batista was, was heavily involved with them. Whether they could declare how they got that money or not. Absolutely, absolutely, and and obviously we're we're to, we're not just talking about um, you know about American American industries that are that we we would ordinarily consider to be above board. We're also talking about things like organized crime, uh, which was which was certainly a factor there. And it's interesting, you know, by in the 1950s, you know, we think about Cuba as being this exceptionally poor country, and um, and you know we we can talk about why that is because there are there are many reasons why that is why, why that is both both because of U.S. involvement and other reasons, but it, in the 1950s, Cuba was a pretty wealthy country by by those standards, even though that wealth was not necessarily very well distributed. There was certainly a large poor population of, of, of Cubans, uh, but there was a lot of wealth that was circulating throughout the, 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 uh, the island. And, and so that's, but I think it's important to think about the, the large poor population as you get into the late 1950s and people really start souring on, on Batista, you know, there's always a why. I mean, you, you, you don't get a Castro and a Che Guevara and other people that just show up. Um, to an island that is that is you know wealthy and well run and say hey we should do something different um, you do don't... it's just they don't get anywhere well <laughs> you, you can have people talking about it but, but you're right you, you're not going to get a successful revolution without without a reason to revolt mm -hmm. and in the in this case you you had to develop a reason for people to be dissatisfied with with the status quo and so this is so. I guess we, we're kind of at this point. If we're thinking about the the history of Cuba, we're probably up into about mm, let's call it about 1956, maybe, um, Chris. And so at this point, you have um, you have a a number of different uh, different leaders of of kind of uh, what we would call um, revolutionaries, and 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 they're not necessarily all communists or any of them. Most of them really clearly communists or anything like that. You know, they're they're mo mostly what I would consider to be more kind of populist. I guess is at least initially is what I would say, Chris. I don't know what, what how how you would react to that. Um, I would say there there's kind of what they want to do economically, yeah. but the the unifying factor is what they want to do nationally. Uh -huh. They are nationalist. Yes, they are just national sovereignists, independence people. 
let's kick out, you know, maybe not kick out the Americans, but let's, you know, Cuba for the Cubans. Cuba for the and Cubans. once we get that, then we'll figure out how to distribute things and answer all those other questions. Right. And the and at first there there were a lot of different movements and they and there there was and I agree with you Chris there were definitely those central themes there but uh, they had different ideas about how how to do that uh, but one one of the of the revolutionary movements sort of gained preeminence by I would say between 1956 and probably 1958 and that is the uh, and that is of course uh, Castro's movement uh, the, or what's called what we will sometimes hear it called the July 26th movement um, so he he became really kind of the leading dissident force there and what's interesting is by this point again we're probably 1957 1958 the US is kind of souring or the we'll just say that by the US I mean the Eisenhower administration it's kind of souring on Batista. And so what's fascinating about this is, is during this time, we were not supporting Batista. We were, we were indirectly supporting Castro, um, which is, which when we think about it now is seems really odd. Um, and by indirectly supporting mean that we were embargoing weapons from Batista. And so he had to acquire them through other means. And I think he, I don't know where he got, I think he got him through like Dominican Republic or other places like that. But, you know, it's he he really did. Um, he really was not getting U.S. support. And we were kind of tacitly supporting Castro's forces because we we saw him as somebody who would bring democracy maybe uh, to Cuba. And, and so that and that was kind of one of our stated goals is to bring, quote unquote, democracy to um, to the Caribbean and Latin America. Now, did we do a good job of that? Did we pick the right people for democracy? Uh, it was very mixed for us. <laughs> well, it, it, we can you can argue that. Um, it's also once we got him in, did we really? We, we'll talk about this in a second, but I do want to yeah. come back to how did let's just finish up how Castro got there, how uh -huh. Castro finished up, and you know, the 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 famous scene is on New Year's Eve right. of 1958. Mm -hmm. Um, Batista got on a plane with, I've heard $300 million. I've, I mean, I've heard the same, the same number, like $300 that. million. And again, this is, these are, this is 300 million in, in 1958 dollars. Yes. So probably, I mean, well over a billion now. Yeah. And, and flew initially to the Dominican Republic, mm -hmm. um, but was so toxic there that he wound up living out his life in Portugal. Mm -hmm. Um, but what's left out is in early December, I, I want to say the date I saw on this was the 12th. Not only had we embargoed arms to Batista, but the United States ambassador sat him down and said, we no longer support you mm -hmm. as the leader of Cuba. You need to go away. You need to go away. And he did. I mean, it took yes. him a little while, but, but he, but he did by the end of the month. And then. Right. It was a it was a matter of days after Batista left that that Castro Castro's forces entered Havana. It was something. It was if it was January 9th, I think maybe or something like that. It was yeah. it was very very soon within 1959 uh, that Castro's forces entered Havana. And again, we we initially saw him as bringing democracy to Cuba. Now here's the interesting thing. 1959, this is still Eisenhower. Eisenhower, still Eisenhower is still president for literally two years in January of 59. And I would also point out, not only is Eisenhower president, Richard Nixon is vice president. And that's yes. actually kind of important. <laughs> okay, okay. So we've got Castro in power. Take us forward from there. Okay, so, so Castro is in power. It's 1959. Uh, the, the relationship between the U.S. and and in Cuba, or at least the Castro regime, soured pretty quickly. So he did some a couple of things that we didn't like. And so one of, one of the things that that we really didn't like is he legalized the Communist Party. Um, we were not a fan of that. The other thing that he did was he purged pro Batista forces within the law enforcement and military, and some of those people were executed. I would say that that was not something we were excited about, but that was probably not the deal breaker. Some of the deal breakers that that were were that he started taking land and other resources from U.S. companies, and and that was a that was a huge deal. He nationalized industries. He took took land from people. 
And you know, when the, this is the United States, I mean, we don't we don't like it when people mess with our money, <laughs> right? Right. You know, for better or for or for worse. And so then we 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 responded to this, and and again, this happened over the first year or so. We responded to this in 1960 by imposing uh, sanctions and a trade embargo. And you know, this has been a decades long trade embargo on on Cuba. And so Cuba said, okay. So we're not able to trade with the United States. I bet I know who else would like to trade with us. And so they signed a, a, an agreement with the Soviet Union um, in, 19, in, in 1960. So obviously, we are no longer fans of Castro at this point. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so let's, by the way, do you have anything to say about Cuba in the 1960 election? Because it um, actually it, comes up. It comes up. And so I, I mentioned, uh, of course, that that the vice president in 1959 and 1960 was Richard Nixon, who was also the Republican candidate for president. And and he and in, in many of the debates, he squared, of course, he squared off against John F. Kennedy, who was the Democratic nominee for um, uh, for for president. And they it, you know, it, it was obviously it was a very different uh, Republican and Democratic Party at that point. Um, but you know, Nixon had already had some some pretty good chops as a cold warrior um, at this point. And so nobody doubted um, that that Nixon was a was an anti-communist. Nobody felt like he had a particular need to prove his bona fides for this. Kennedy was not that person. Kennedy did it, needed to prove or, or, or certainly felt like he needed to prove his that he was he too could be a cold warrior and that he had anti-communist chops. And so during the debates, Kennedy, not Nixon, came out as the as the person who was the more hard line against Cuba. And so that really set the backdrop for what he did and what he felt he had to do once he was once he was elected. And so, yeah, go for it. Chris. One you other to... thing I, 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 I find interesting. First, you kind of had a little and, you know, not not as much, but in the 1950s, the early 50s, mm -hmm. you had this idea of in the United States that Truman had lost China. Yeah. The fact that it was our country to lose is, is something we don't need to talk about. Right. Uh, but that it was the weakness of the Truman administration. And what McCarthy is saying at this point is the flat out treason of people within the State Department that are intentionally giving advice that leads to Mao's successful revolution in China. There's a there's hints of that in Kennedy's attacks on the Eisenhower Nixon administration of you lost Cuba. You lost and, and, Cuba. Right. And, well, and this, the, oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah. sorry, go ahead, Chris. And this well, and just just to just to kind of follow that up, this is sort of shades of the of the Monroe Doctrine as well. Yes. And so yes. this is a you know th this is the Western Hemisphere is ours, guys, and you and you lost this country for the communists in the Western right. Hemisphere. This is in our backyard. And and by the way, the the interesting thing is one of the ways one of the attacks that Kennedy makes, and this is going to be important for what we're going to talk about later, is not so much that you lost it because you didn't support Batista enough. Mm -hmm. You lost it because you supported Batista in all of these crazy, horrible, bad things he's doing. Right. And like you said, created the conditions that led to Castro. Right. And so if we could have interrupted this uh, way earlier, then we, we, we may have had somebody who really was pro-democratic and pro-American um, who really could have run run Cuba as you know our style of liberal democracy? Now, whether that's true or not, we don't. We'll, we'll never really know for sure. I mean, we can we can certainly speculate because that's what we do on this show. But uh, but that that is certainly something we could speculate about. So yeah, so very very interesting kind of interplay between what, what was going on with Cuba that we kind of chased them into the arms of the Soviet Union in some sense, or at least that was that was their 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 perspective on things, and you had a very um, a, a very significant set of discussions about Cuba in the 1960 um, election, and and as uh, and as we've already talked about on the show, so you and Don had talked about the the 1960 election as a, as a what if, and so but now we're talking about it as a what did, and so is through a a very very small margin, Kennedy won the 1960 presidency, and so came into in 1961 with uh, with you know certainly optimism, certainly the the overall support of the country. 
but not really the hugest mandate um, of any president that, that's ever come in. And he's young. He's a, he was a U.S. senator for some amount of time, not a huge amount of time. And so he has to prove himself. And w- let's take one more other th- and, and, and trace some other things that are go- leading into this. When he does inherit the presidency, he inherits a plan that the Eisenhower administration has been working on to remove Castro from Cuba, to remove the Cuban government and replace them with a more friendly government. Yeah, that's right. So let's let's back up. Let's back up. <laughs> we're, we're so we're going to talk talk CIA, and you know this this discussion is not is not going to be very pro CIA. And you know and hey, you know some of my best friends are spies, but still, um, we're not going to be uh, we're not going to be terribly pro CIA here because there there is certainly some um, assumptions that they made in, in all of this that were probably not good ones. But yeah. By 1960, uh, it was pretty clear to the U.S. government, again, going back to the Eisenhower administration, that Castro needed to go. And so the idea, so the, but this is not something that we felt like we could just go in and, and, and take him out. Can't just invade Cuba because the, the fear was that the Soviet Union would invade somewhere else, you know, you know, West Germany, you know, the, you know other, other places that we, w- we do not want them to invade. So we, we, we feared reciprocity. So the idea was if you get the CIA involved and instead of having a U.S. force that, go, that goes in, you had a group of Cuban exiles that they trained as, uh, they trained as counter-revolutionaries and you drop them in somewhere in Cuba and they go and they, um, they oust Castro and they take it back over and somebody else is installed as, as the leader of Cuba. It seems very nice on paper. By the way, this isn't new. This isn't fresh out of the box. They've done this in a it, couple of other places. Well, and I'm and the, the place I'm thinking of off the top of my head is Guatemala. They started the first one. We actually worked with the British on our first mm-hmm. one and helped them overthrow the Iranian prime minister mm-hmm. in oh, 53, yeah. 54 time frame. Sure. Um, basically gave, went in and threw a bunch of money to, yes, this guy, when you hear the name, you're going to be surprised. Ayatollah Khomeini's mm-hmm. street religious people, we threw around some money and th- they got our friendly Shah back in power. Mm-hmm. There's also the suggestion that they were involved in the colonel's coup in egypt Mm -hmm. that overthrew uh farouk the second Mm -hmm. there and brought in nasser Nasser. yeah and then guatemala by the way looking back on these nasser in egypt iran these are not a highlight reel right guatemala worked out pretty well and in each of these cases it worked out relatively well that in each of these instances they had basically like thrown some crazy crazy plan together and it worked Mm -hmm. and it wound up working so when they're putting this plan together for cuba let's put another crazy it's worked up till now it's worked up till now so let's put another crazy plan together (laughs) right and so they they put they put this crazy plan together um, that was approved by President Eisenhower, and the, and then this this group of I, I think it was something like fourteen hundred people trained in Guatemala, and there were some CIA operations officers, and they, and and if memory serves, there were a, a few U.S. military attaches that were that were there, but but it wasn't a quote unquote U.S. force um, that, that was training. It wasn't a U.S. force that did that did most of it there were american pilots that were involved and and that's actually that's actually really important to the story because that's that was one of the the reasons why the bay of pigs was chosen and and not and another area wasn't chosen is 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 because of of airfields um and also just because of the ability for i think it was b26 bombers to um to to be able to get to the area so let let let's Kennedy inherits this plan. Yep. 
Um, let's pause real quick because I know we sometimes have uh, some sponsors. So here's a word from the sponsors. When we come back, we're going to talk about what happened, what was the actual plan, and how we think it changed from there. Would groceries delivered to you in as fast as one hour save you a trip to the store? Instacart makes that possible thanks to personal shoppers in your area who hand select items based on your preferences from the stores you love. And shopping multiple stores is possible on a single order. Instacart picks the freshest produce and even keeps your eggs safe, all while finding everything you usually buy, providing smart suggestions for new items, and even highlighting deals to help you save money. And now you get free delivery on your first order over $35. Let Instacart know we sent you and help support our show by following the link in the show notes. Instacart. Groceries delivered in as fast as one hour. Welcome back to A Fork in Time. So, yeah, we just spent a good half hour giving you what actually wound, what, what did happen. Uh, let's see how long it takes us to talk about what could have or what might have. So... It's January 1961, and one of the first things on Kennedy's desk is this plan mm -hmm. to overthrow Castro and install a friendly government in Cuba. Now, you were talking about B-26s right. and, and American bombers. What is the story behind those? Well, my understanding is is that the, the this was a kind of a, a three part plan, um, the the Bay of Pigs, the for the or or the Cuban, we'll say that the the Cuban insurgency, or counterinsurgency. This was a um, we hadn't decided on Bay of Pigs for some amount of time. There were there were a couple of other options, including one um, one in, in, that was a little further away from Havana, as memory serves. But the idea was that that there would that there would be some strategic bombing of of the areas by these B twenty twenty sixes before that forces were were landed. These were naval forces that were landed, uh, and so there was there were three parts. Of course, there were there were these um, we'll call these you know a marine force, if you will, because they function as marines basically um, that that came across um, on on boats and were supported by air. Um, and that actually becomes really important later in the story that there was this initial air support and the plan called for continued air support, continued naval support, um, and continued logistical support for these, uh, uh, for, for these, uh, th these uh, Cuban troops that had landed at the Bay of Pigs. Okay, um, so what were the other options? What, what, el what else was on the table? My understanding is that that one of the things that was on the table was an alternate location called Trinidad. Um, do you want to talk about yes. that? Do you know anything about that, Chris? Yes, I do. Uh, uh -huh. Trinidad is a little more. Uh, Cuba's really easy to talk about geographically because it's just a long, thin stretch of land. Um, so Trinidad is a little closer to the middle. It, it, it's almost in the middle of Cuba. Um, and if we're talking about this here, Havana is on the northwest side of the island, the closest part to the United States. But interestingly, for what we're talking about here, the closest part also to the Yucatan and Central America. Mm -hmm. This these bombers, this air support was operating not out of the United States territory that's 90 miles away. It was operating across the entire Gulf of Mexico from friendly airstrips in Nicaragua and um, Honduras. Mm -hmm. This area, Santiago, is the other, re it's important for a couple of reasons. One, it's further away from Havana. Mm -hmm. Countries like to keep a lot of troops in their capital. So you don't want to attack right there if you're trying to get set up. Um, Santiago is also an actual city. It's a port. Anybody who knows anything about the um, discussions of D-Day in, in World War II knows it's helpful to have a port because that way you can land all of your troops a lot quicker. You can get all of their support ashore a lot quicker. 
But the third, and I think the most important thing to think about when it comes to Santiago is that it is a port itself, but it's in the foothills of the Escambre Mountains. Mm -hmm. And the Escambre Mountains are the, were at this point the base camp of one of those other anti Batista revolutionary guerrilla groups that didn't exactly go along with the Castro game plan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the idea was one, it's further away from prying eyes of the enemy's capital. It's got a port so you can land relatively easy there. And the hinterlands, the area that you're going to be advancing into is already probably friendly and has some people there that you want to provide assistance to mm -hmm. and will provide some help to you. Mm -hmm. is, is that pretty fair? I think that's pretty fair. I mean, I think those are definitely things that we that we wanted. And, and I think you know, one of the things that that probably maybe doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it, say it anyway, is that under no circumstances did we think that it was just going to be the 1400 people that were going to do all of this. The idea was that they were they were going to find popular support. Um, they were going to basically build this movement against against Castro and that that movement of, of many people was going to eventually sweep them towards Vanna and they were going to retake the island. It, so speaking about, by the way, go back to one thing. Castro himself, the entire Cuban revolution itself started with one boat, the grandma. Mm -hmm. It landed in Santa Clara area, which is further east of the island, almost over towards like Santiago or for Americans, that's where Guantanamo Bay is. One boat full of people landed and it grew from there. So if you land four boats full of people, well, that's just a quarter of the amount of time, right? That's, yeah, that's that's three <laughs> boats too many. Well, and and the and the other thing that should be said is is the the Cuban Revolution what had been reasonably successful to this point, but was not complete. You know, but Castro did not have the real, you know, stranglehold on power that certainly, you know, Chris, you and I remember him having when we were growing up in the 80s. You know, this is this was a very different Cuba, a very dead and a very different Castro at this point. And so there was there was still some consolidation that needed to take place. That becomes important a little bit later on. Um, as in kind of the aftermath here, but, uh, but yeah, so, so why, why did they did not decide to go kind of the Santiago route, Chris? Because it's, well, the Trinidad route or the Trinidad Santiago's, route. by the way, Santiago's on the other side by where we keep Guantanamo Bay. If anything right. happens right. out in Santiago, the United States is getting the finger pointed right at them. That, that is, <laughs> that is true. My, my mistake. So Trinidad. Yes. So, so um, why did, why did we not do Trinidad? Because it's right in the middle. Yeah. Because it's too far from, we don't want to use Guantanamo because that is a little too close to our, our, our zone of influence. We didn't want to you, um, and and the fact was they had this idea of providing that air support. That is one thing they thought the United States could really do. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a relatively newer, more technical field. We can go in and provide that, and if we got a bunch of bearded guys, we just drop them off in the jungle. They, you know, and their support, wonderful. This is this is beautiful. Um, the problem was because of where Trinidad is, it was too far for the air support to reach it from right. the from the. Um, bases they would be flying from we're using I, I one thing i do want to point out we're using what are called a or b 26s right a for attack b for bomber 26s these are twin engine prop planes that we used back in world war ii these are basically contemporaries of the b-25s that you saw taking off in the doolittle raid from american carriers absolutely yeah and these and are a little bit of vintage equipment, but that's very important for us because if they're brand new jet bombers, nobody's going to believe these are Cuban defectors. They right. have to be actual kind of equipment that Cubans actually would have been using that would well, have yeah. almost trickled down to their military. 
Absolutely. Yeah. We had to, we, we, we wanted to maintain some veneer of, of deniability. It was a very thin veneer, um, but we had to maintain some of that. So yeah, that's, that's a very good point. And, and it, and it plays into a part, but because, you know, these B-26s did not have the range as our newer aircraft did. And so we had to launch them because I recall, and I think you might've mentioned this, Chris, they were, these were all launched from kind of Central America. You know, these were launched from kind of the other, the other direction. Um, yeah. These are not, you know, launched from a base in Florida. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, they have this plan. Um, as I understand it, it was actually presented to the Joint Chiefs. Mm-hmm. And one of the members of the Joint Chiefs, a guy named David Shoup, who at this point is the Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, and won the Congressional Medal of Honor for his role in the invasion of Tarawa. Do you think this guy knows something about amphibious invasions? <laughs> Probably a little bit. <laughs> um, almost laughed it out of the room because it just, it makes a lot of rookie mistakes. Mm-hmm. Um, the air support isn't continuous. When you look at even stupid little things, but when you do this for a living and are that good at it, you, you think about all of the medical supplies are on one ship, right? All of the ammunition is on another ship. What happens if something happens to that ship? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So they may, this plan is, is really, and, and there's actually been interesting psychological studies put together about why did people not say more about this plan? Right. Why, why did these, you know, respected military figures let this go through? Um, it, and it's been used as a case study in, in group think. Mm-hmm. Um, and, exactly. so, and so why do you, you know, why does a group go together on something that, that if ob- objectively we all recognize is maybe not the, the right course of action. And then also this cold war mindset. I mean, I think that the, there was this idea that we got to do something uh, you know, just the, the, because at, at this point, even though, you know, it may seem a little odd to us with, with uh, kind of with a modern lens, you know, the idea of Castro remaining in power was at that point, pretty intolerable to us. You know, this was, this was not something that was going to, that was going to fly for us at that point. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think we've got everything about the pre, you know, we've set up a lot of stuff about what is actually going to happen when boots hit the ground it's almost anticlimactic because boots hit the ground and yeah you remember when i asked what happens if something happens to the one ship that all your medical supplies are on guess what something happened to the something one ship that all your medical ship. supplies are on <laughs> yeah um they did land and it did not work out well it one of not. the things um do you want to talk a little bit about all of the different air raid, all of the different air attacks because this is a little this is a little convoluted. Yeah. So there really is kind of a, it's kind of a prelude to the invasion. And so, you know, we're, and so just so, so we, so just so everybody it, it kind of has a, a little bit of agenda setting the, it was really, it was really early morning on April 17th of 1961 um, that, that I, that I think about as being sort of your invasion day. But if you think about like the, 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 the attacks beforehand, really kind of the 14th or 15th of April, you had some diversionary landings and you had, and on the 15th of April, you also had a, a, a bombing of three Cuban airfields. And these were, um, these were in different areas. These were not, um, not in the, in the Bay of Pigs area. Um, one uh, was near Havana. And then there was a couple other locations that escaped me at this point, but they, they also, they were prepared to not have us markings on them. And so they, um, so they definitely were, were, were trying to disguise them at this point. So they had, so this happened about two days beforehand that they had a lot of these, um, a, a lot of these, these planes happening. And then, and there was actually one of the aircraft was, was lost if, um, if, if memory serves. And um, so that's, that's kind of interesting as well. And, and there was another one, another aircraft that was damaged and managed to limp back home not to Central America, but to Florida. So again, it was a very thin veneer um, of our um, of our deniability. It wasn't damaged. As I understand it, what they did is they took the engine cowling 
which oh, okay. if you're familiar with it is that metal piece of that round piece of metal that covers the engine intake they took that off the plane they set it aside on the field they shot bullets into it uh-huh. and then they put it back on the plane so that it could land in florida and say we're cuban defectors and we were shot at by the cuban government and here's the hole in our plane to prove it okay i, I actually i did not know that that's very interesting <laughs> So th- this uh, this happened on the fifteenth of April, and and the and the Cubans complained about it. They complained about it to the UN, um, and which was which is very interesting. So we're we're not being that sneaky at this point. You know, they the the Cubans know something is going to happen. Um, they don't know exactly where. They don't know exactly what, but they know something is going to happen. And, it, and, you know, interestingly, the, the ambassador to the, uh, to the United Nations at this point was Adelaide Stevenson, um, who was, you know, I, I think, you know, tried to be fundamentally an honest guy, but had been lied to by the CIA. And the CIA said, nope, this, you know, definitely not something we're doing here. No U.S. armed forces are involved. We're not intervening in Cuba. Um, we're making sure that no Cubans, uh, no citizens would would participate in any of these actions. And so Stevenson said that to the UN, which was not true. Um, and he was actually pretty, he was pretty upset when he found out that he'd been lied to by the CIA. So very, very interesting there. Um, so again, so again, you you had uh, you had this happen in the United Nations. Then you also had a purge. Uh, of of what they were considered to be suspected anti revolutionary forces in in Cuba to make sure that they that any um, any potential collaborators would have been uh, would would have been detained at that point. So to interesting. Some extent, the Castro government uses this as an excuse. As an excuse. Use it to go ahead and round up some people that they were a little suspicious about. Right. Right. And so then, over the course of of April sixteenth, you start having the the invasion fleet that's that uh, that assembles, and it assembles about um, off the coast of Cuba. And then over, and then very early in the morning of April seventeenth, they uh, they, I think it's two of the ships, two of the four ships maybe land, um, if I if I remember right. And the fourteen hundred Cuban exiles land, and they call themselves Brigade twenty five oh six. Um, which is which I think is very uh, very interesting kind of kind of bland sounding name for 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 this sort of force um, and they land troops they land tanks they land other vehicles um, so that's uh, so that's that's how the invasion starts on the very early in the morning on April seventeenth nineteen sixty one. How'd it go? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> Not well. Well, so the uh, they had a lot of logistical problems. Um, there, there was there were delays in unloading the troops, as you mentioned. There were uh, you, they, some of their supplies were not did not come come at all. Um, it was um, it was really a, it was really very problematic. And there were some additional uh, additional airstrikes that happened in support of those troops at that at that point. Um, so that that's. Um, so that that was kind of in, in support of the of the the overall effort, but it really it wasn't enough. Um, there were some paratroops that were to, that were that were eventually dropped, which is which is kind of kind of interesting that they would decide to do that. Um, they uh, it only only took a few hours before Castro to to basically issue a statement um, over the radio, um, basically saying that these are, these people are trying to destroy the revolution. They're going to take your rights. They're going to take your, you know, they're going to, they're going to kill you. Um, and so that, that, uh, that, that was happening very, very quickly, um, that, that, that this sort of, sort of thing happened. Um, there was a, di- uh, that night there was an additional airstrike that pretty much failed, um, didn't really accomplish very much. Um, and, um, and so, but by this point, the, the troops are not really making, much if any progress and they're using up their ammunition uh, there and some of them are starting to some of them are killed some of them are starting to surrender um, and so it's not going well um, by the the 18th of April by that next day and by the way when you say airstrike I almost caught you on something what are the pre are are are, are, are Cubans the only ones with planes in the air at this point that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that, Chris. You, 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 you I, 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 <laughs> the if you look at the records, there's 
the F and, and you have to be very clear when you're reading this because the FAL is the um, Liberty Air Force for the American backed Bay of Pigs Cubans, but there's also the FAR, the Revolutionary Air Force, right. which are the Cuban Castro. Because everybody's a Cuban in this scenario. Or, everybody's or, a but, Cuban. It's just a, what what side are you? But, what side are you on? You're exactly the Castro right. Castro Cubans are flying captured A twenty sixes that we had given to Batista. So these this is the equipment they're using, and they're bombing those ships. Mm -hmm. A they're flying the exact same planes. B these planes have the exact same markings because we're trying we're to pretend FAR. these are Cuban defectors. That's right. Good. That is a, that is a really good point. <laughs> and then they start point. bombing the sh supply ships that are uh -huh. sending ashore everything. They do sink the medical supply ship. And it wasn't just medical, but, but it was all of the medical supplies were on that ship and they damage an ammunition ship. I, I actually think they damage the ammunition and blow up the fuel ship. Mm -hmm. So not, you know, they're operating close enough for bombers to get there. They don't have anybody protecting them. They don't have shorter range fighters and the Cubans are using their air force against these ships. And then you have the brigade 2506 ashore who are just shooting it get to the point that they shoot at anything overhead because mm -hmm. same planes, same markings. Know, right. And we just saw one of our ships blow up. There's obviously pro Castro Cubans above us. We're not taking chances. Absolutely. And so at this point, so they have very, very few supplies. So a lot of their supplies have been, has, have been destroyed. So very few supplies. They have very little ammunition their uh, their force at what's what's called Red Beach there is coming under under uh, under counterattack by the by the Cuban army and unofficial militia. So things are not going well. There there is some there is a couple of airdrops of more ammunition, so that helps a little bit. But um, but it's still very uh, going very badly at this point. And and uh, and so the uh, the other thing that that should be kept in mind is. At this point, the Soviet Union is is obviously not happy with this whole scenario, and you know the Soviet Union and everybody they're they're not they're not stupid. They know they know what's going on here, uh, and so Khrushchev sends a telegram to Kennedy on the day after the invasion, basically saying that they would not allow us to invade Cuba, and if we did invade Cuba, that there that there could be nuclear retribution at that point. So. Yeah, you know, this is this is starting to sound maybe just a little like the um, a, another crisis that we've talked about on the show that happened the next year. Uh, but, but so Kennedy's caught in a very bad position here. You either you either you're either all in on this and you see what happens, or you're not all in on this and you see what happens. And so Kennedy kind of decides the latter um, at this point and says, you know, we're not all in on this. We're not we're not going to go in. Because there was a, um, there were some Marines in Puerto Rico that were ready to go. Um, that I don't know if you knew about that, Chris. We did. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and point this out. We just talked about them. We had Marines on the island of Cuba in Guantanamo. We did. Too, we did that too. <laughs> but they're, but they, they're a bit closer. They're a bit closer. But we had a, we had a, I guess we should have a separate uh, group of Marines mm -hmm. that were in Puerto Rico that were ready to support this, and we had. We and there aircraft were aircraft carriers aircraft carriers coast. you had a lot a lot of naval assets that were outside of 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 cuban territorial waters but were relatively close by so we had the we had the equipment and we had the 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 people that could have been there for, to support this but uh but then kennedy has to make a decision and so what decision does he make chris he cuts bait you're on your own and and uh, once they were on their own, the uh, the the U.S. air support stopped. Um, the um, there was there was no possibility for further naval support. And how long did how long did the uh, did the attack last after that? 
after that, I want to say, I want to say it was a three day total affair on the It was ground. a three day total affair. So after this, after the US support started, started to, to, to disappear, it was within 48 hours and, and there, and, and it, the, the, the whole thing was done. The only thing that was done additionally um, were there, there were some naval assets that were used to rescue people um, and a small, a relatively small number of these Cuban exiles were rescued um, by, uh, by U.S. naval, uh, naval assets. So, um, you know, some of the, so there, there was a little bit of involvement there, but again, it was, it was a rescue mission, not a, not, not a true, you know, additional military operation. So that's what happened. Yeah. I, I just realized we probably spent an hour on that. So we, we just did a room where it happened. <laughs> yes. And if you like room where it happened, I would encourage you to look, <laughs> to look at that podcast as well. <laughs> um, all right. So what, What's your fork? What, what so, what's your preferred? Because I, I set mine up pretty well, and and I've uh, got th- this is one of those rare instances for those of you listening. Normally, we do a lot more talking off podcasts, and like when we start this, we know where it's going. Right. I've set mine up. Okay. You, why, what's why don't yours? you? Why don't you go? Why don't you go first? Because I I do have one in mind. Okay. Um. The escambre. Okay. Tell me it, about it just that. Uh, we talked about it, the Trinidad landing site. It makes so much more sense if you are going to keep this off books. Okay. If you're going to keep this low US involvement, that's where you do it. You once how many guerrilla forces have their own air force? How many guerrilla once, forces? Not yes. very many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> once you start bringing planes into it, you lose all sense of plausible non- deniability. You've got a bunch of people that are tr- that are foot soldiers, that are infantrymen, that know Cuba, that could blend in, and you've already got people there doing the things you want. So why not build on that and further support that if you capture an actual port, you can bring in boatloads of support to them. You don't need to worry about night operations and airdrops or anything like that. And that's a probably a, an effective way to make mm-hmm. this happen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that absolutely, <laughs> it would be, we did, by no means does that guarantee success, but it, but operationally, it's a it's a much better plan um, than what was than what was originally decided. So that's um, so I, I I actually really I really like that that idea. So I had a I had a different one, and which is so this is great. Um, I really like that you, yours is more kind of a different military operation. So so mine is totally different, and mine relies on the influence of Dean Rusk. So uh, we know that this was an, an Eisenhower initiated plan that was approved by Kennedy about a week after taking office. And so that's, and that, and so you had a, uh, you had a relatively, you know, an inexperienced, a new president um, who had run on a, on a cold warrior platform. Um, and so felt like he really needed to, to have a, um, um, he really needed to have a hardline approach to, to Cuba. His Secretary of State was Dean Rusk, um, who was uh, who actually served throughout through the entire Ke- um, Kennedy and Johnson administrations, and was uh, had a, a a long history in as a um, as an Assistant Secretary of State in a couple of administrations. But he had very big misgivings about this plan. He was not in favor of the of the plan, and he really didn't say as much as he later said he wished he had. So the point of departure is it's January 28, 1961, and Kennedy is, is in, in is it, let's just assume that there was a cabinet meeting that day. I have no idea if that, if that was the case or whatever cabinet meeting led to this approval. And Rusk says, Mr. President, I don't, I don't feel good about this plan. I, I think its chances of success are very low. I think we should explore other options. I agree we need to take a hardline approach to Cuba, but not this hardline approach because the, the potential for blowback is 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 significant 
And Kennedy says, okay, Mr. Secretary, what would you have, what would you do instead? And Russ comes up with something that is totally different. We don't know what it would be, no idea, but somehow Kennedy says to, you know, tells the CIA saying, you know what, this is a new administration. I understand you have this, you have these logistics um, in place under the previous administration, pack it up. We're not doing it. This is, this is done. And then there, there is no Bay of Pigs at all. And I think that would be very interesting because I think, and, and I'll be interested in what you think about this, Chris, I think if there's no Bay of Pigs, there's no Cuban Missile Crisis, or at least not in 1962. So I'm not sure about that. Okay. I think actually you do have a Cuban Missile Crisis. Okay. I'll admit maybe not 62. Okay. But the other thing is, I think you have a much, much worse Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh, interesting. So first, um, to kind of tie back into the last episode we did on the space race, um, and, and, and also c capacities that we're talking about here, um, in Khrushchev's telegram of, I guess, day two of the invasion, Mm -hmm. where he threatens nuclear destruction of the American heartland. Mm -hmm. How realistic is that? Not very realistic at the time. <laughs> <laughs> given, given the capacities of the Soviet Union at this point, yeah. it, it's not really realistic. Um, but let's go down the route. But where could he hit? So, like, so is he going to... Yes. So again, I'm, I, I grew up in Kansas, mm -hmm. Chris. Is there any way that Khrushchev is going to hit Kansas in 1961 or 1962? Probably not. Uh, he'd definitely go after Omaha. I don't think you guys would really miss that. <laughs> I feel like there's some college football uh, I, rivalries I, that are going to get set on by you. I lived in Omaha for 12 years. I like <laughs> Omaha. It's a, it's, a, it's a nice city. But yeah, but yeah, Omaha, <laughs> Omaha would be a primary target uh, because of the existence of Strategic yeah. Air Command. Uh, but, but he Which, could, by the way, list. that's why it's there. Because yeah. it's in the middle and is in the hardest part to hit. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think, but he could hit other targets in Europe, um, mm -hmm. in in Central Europe at that point, and that and that would have also been very very bad for for our alliance. Um, so the, so there the, he could certainly do some damage. One of the things that is not lost on me and was not lost on Castro and was not lost on on Che Guevara is. The Bay of Pigs solidified their hold on power very significantly. Uh, and a fact that, that Guevara actually wrote a letter to Bobby Kennedy basically saying, you guys did us a big favor here um, because this, you know, this revolution was not, was not done until after the Bay of Pigs. And then once you invaded and everybody saw who you really were, then we could complete the revolution. Uh, so it's that, that's not lost on me that that, that, that happened. But I, I do want to come back to why is the Cuban Missile Crisis that much worse? Okay, I, yeah, I want to hear this because that's a that's a very that's an interesting perspective, Chris. Um, first and foremost, Khrushchev was a chancer. Uh huh. He was a gambler, and as much hay as Kennedy in the nineteen sixty election made out of the bomber and the missile gap. Maybe he hasn't been brief. You know, this is one of those debates. How much did he? How much of it was him being just disingenuous and knowing that we had technical superiority, but realizing that we can't say we do or say how we know we have superiority? Right. And how much of it was him just basing off of what he actually knew at the time? But I feel like by this April telegram from Khrushchev, he knew it was a bluff. Uh -huh. Khrushchev knew it was a bluff. Right. Khrushchev doesn't want it to be a bluff. And so if you've got Dean Rusk's solution of taking a step back and, okay, we're, we're engaging Cuba in other ways, maybe not militarily, those other ways aren't going to pay fruit by October of 62. That's true. That's true. But is there, but also is there a, is there as much of a, a, a of a kind of a sense of um, a sense of the need, the immediate need for having those missiles in Cuba on the part of either the Cubans or the Soviets, if there was no invasion. 
And so that's that that would be the question is I, I could easily see where you're right that there is a there is a worse a worse Cuban Missile Crisis. Could it also be a later one? Uh, it might be a later one. I haven't even gotten to what makes it so much worse. Okay. Yeah. Um, this is one of the things I talked about in the 1960 election episode, which is when things change, people change. Yeah. Um, and you're right that Kennedy, that Dean Rusk, and you know, isn't it kind of surprising that after something flops that spectacularly, everyone said they were against it. They just didn't say how much they were against it. Very true. <laughs> um, but Kennedy is out there and he's looking back at his advisors and every single one of them is now saying how much they were opposed to it. He changed his view of how much he trusted the military and his intelligence officers. He Absolutely. said afterwards, I want to break the CIA into a million pieces and scatter it into the wind. He did say that. He absolutely, he didn't do it. But he, but he, what he did do is he, is he pushed s several of the, of the leaders of the CIA yes. out by 1962. Yes. So it was a different CIA after 1962 than it was before. So let's say that that doesn't happen. I see where you're going with this, Chris. I, I, oh, I like this. This is a re okay. Okay, play it, play it out because I, I, I like this a lot. And you've now got this Kennedy who you just talked about. He doesn't quite have bona fides. Mm -hmm. um, he has been shown up at the Vienna meeting with Khrushchev, mm -hmm. and it's and and you're right. I think it's a possibility that it's later. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Cubans can consolidate as much and see as much of a threat from the United States. That being said, I guarantee I, I don't see anything that would put any pause in Khrushchev pushing to have the missiles there as soon as possible. I think that's fair. And, and, and this kind of comes, comes back to our last podcast where we were talking <laughs> about Jupiter missiles in, in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, so this is Khrushchev saying, well, Cuba is our Turkey. And so if the yes. Americans are going to have Jupiter missiles there, we want our missiles in Cuba. Right. So let's just say, so I'm okay. Here's the scenario I'm coming <laughs> up with. You have a, you have a Kennedy that's not a little older and a little wiser is still too trusting of military advisors. You have a, maybe a, a difficult, a more difficult uh, 1962 midterm election because Kennedy is, um, his, is maybe not quite as popular as he would have been otherwise. And so you, so he, and now he feels like he's in a, in a, in more of a political fight and now it's 1963 and now the missiles are in Cuba and now he has a choice to make. Or even more so, even keeping the same timeline and it's mm -hmm. October 62. Mm -hmm. he's, now you've got the elections coming up next month. He does have the elections coming up next month and he doesn't have that experience of, why not to trust the military right he's got pictures in front of him he's got curtis lemay telling him that we will get every missile on the first strike mm -hmm. and without that learning experience from the bay of pigs i don't think he i don't think he stands up and says or looks for because it, it, you know, looking at looking at the behavior of XCOM, mm -hmm. he and from all of the tapes, he is sitting there seeking out answers from every single person. Right. That is not what he does going into the Bay of Pigs invasion. No, it's not. And that is a learning experience. That is something he learned. Okay. Because of the Bay of Pigs. Okay. Uh, I, I like that, Chris. I like that. I think that, you know, to me, that, that, that makes sense. So uh, I think that that is a very plausible result of that. I, I, I do still think that because there's more time needed for Castro to consolidate power, I do think it takes longer um, for, um, for the, the missiles to get there, but I could easily see where, where a, a, a less wise Kennedy um, would have been far more aggressive and far more trusting of military advisors to, you know, again, let's say a 1963 or 1964 Cuban Missile Crisis that could go hot. 
So yeah. I think that I think that is that is a very plausible read on that, Chris. I like that. I hadn't thought about it that way, but I really like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Do you have any other thoughts you'd like to kind of wrap up? We got a really good one, I think. This. No, this was a. As always, Chris, we you and I have a, have just a, a we have a great time um, mm-hmm. recording these podcasts. This has kind of become sort of honestly sort of a weekend ritual for us lately is yeah is we all yeah. we get on and chat and have and record either uh, either a fork in time or a room where it happened and so the only thing I would say is is I would just put a plug in for our listeners is tell your friends about um, yeah. about the these podcasts you know we love getting new listeners and we love getting new collaborators uh, you know again Chris and I have had the the, the fortune of getting to host together the past uh, several weeks but you know, we're always looking for new collaborators and, and, you know, you probably, anybody who's listening recalls, you know, Don specifically saying that, uh, that for a room where it happened, we really, we want listeners to be part of the content creators here. And we really do. And so tell your friends. And I, and so I, I try to tell my friends that, uh, about the, the podcast and I have, you know, one close friend who, who I know listens regularly and, and I'm trying to get some more uh, friends that listen regularly. So, um, I would definitely put in that plug. I, I, I do uh, second that I, my friends are kind of sick of hearing me talk about the ideas before <laughs> I come on. Um, yeah. But, but those that aren't um, yeah, they listen and I'd love to make some more to uh, yeah. some more collaborators, some more opportunities to Absolutely. get some different opinions on here. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We're, we're definitely looking for that. And so if you, if you're, if you're interested by all means, get in contact with the, uh, uh, with Don through the uh, through through the the forum or through email. So uh, we just wrapping it up. Um, Want to thank everybody for your time today. And uh, if you happen to come to a fork in the road, what should they do, Eric? Take it. All right. Thank you, and uh, have a great. Uh, I'm going to say weekend week. Have a great time, everybody. Talk All to you right. later. Thank you. Thanks for listening to A Fork in Time, the alternate history podcast. Learn more and provide feedback by visiting our website at www.aforkintimepodcast.com. Connect to us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash aforkintime or follow us on Twitter at A-F-I-T podcast. If you want to support the show financially, visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash aforkintime. We hope you will join us next time.